statisticians are using R these days to publish brand new methods that implement them. Almost none are doing that in Python. Real statisticians, not data scientists, not computer scientists, not engineers, but but real statisticians use R. Uh, it does the most advanced stuff um, and so forth. Python is very good, having said that. You can do almost everything you can. The Venn diagram has great overlap, but R is best. Uh, and I don't see that changing anytime soon. Uh, best at artificial intelligence. Again, the Venn diagram is overlapping, and R is extremely capable at at plain old machine learning. But when we're talking about all of artificial intelligence, Python is hands down the winner. If you're going to do anything serious um, that goes beyond machine learning, like uh, cluster analysis, random forest, multivariate statistics, if you're going to go beyond that, Python is, is better. It, it's easier because there's a bigger community. It is more powerful. There is more choice. Um, and if if you are trying to use R for doing things like computer vision, deep learning, um, any of the various flavors of neural networks, uh, you can do it, but it uh, your choice is a lot more limited. And you have to sometimes you even have to um, use Python through R to to achieve that. So Python definitely wins for artificial intelligence. Scientific computing, there's almost no difference between these languages. You can do the same thing for day-to-day -day scientific computing with both languages um, needed for data science. I think you need both for, for what we call data science these days. Now, data science for most of you guys in here is, um, is, uh, is different from regular old science. Data science includes all sorts of things that um, most of you guys will never do, that I will never do, um, but for in general, for doing day-to-day -day stuff that encompasses the big picture of data science, you definitely need both. You can't just pick one. It's not good enough uh, right now at this point in time. Easy. Both, both are uh, very easy languages to learn. R was specifically written for non-programmers to learn. Python it was specifically re written as a uh, language that uh, it's often called very easy as a programming language, not not the easiest of programming languages, but it is considered one of the very easy programming languages because the syntax is very close to human language, just like it is in R. Now, which one is easy for non-programmers? Are they both easy for non-programmers? I would say no, actually, on this. Python is very easy, but to become proficient in Python, it's way, way less easy than R. There's more to it. There's more detail. It, at, at the uh, at the what you gain for that extra complexity is you gain massive amounts more power. So Python is more powerful, but it's not as easy to learn as R. Not not even to do easy things. Uh, the learning curve is higher. <clears throat> um, most popular for normal science these days uh, definitely R, and it, it's not changing anytime soon for, for some of the reasons that R has those specific advantages. It's, it's a clear winner for plain old stats, and it's just easier, and it's made for scientists to use literally and explicitly. Most popular for computer science, um, you know, now teaching Python has overtaken Java. And there are a lot more engineer computer scientists um, than there are um, the rest of us. And so if we look at a global scale and you look at like Google searches and Google tutorials for, um, for doing this or that in any old computer language, um, Python is, 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 I think most people would agree, it's, it either is or is nearly the most popular programming language uh, in the world for, for teaching and for, uh, if not for personal use. Um, but it, it dwarfs R, and the, the reason is that R is not a general use language. It's very specific for Python and very specific for non-programmers. It's not a general use uh, to do any task in computing. All right, so um, I wanted to say a little bit, um, I, I could have 
filled up a whole hour with the what I want to say on this slide, but I'm going to restrain myself to about three minutes here so we can get on with something fun today. Um, what I want to say is uh, a few remarks about how we use day to day each of these programming languages. Can I just ask everybody to make sure your mic's turned off uh, right now, please? <clears throat> um, in R, the way that we use it is uh, almost everybody. There are different there are different ways to use R, but almost everybody these days uses whoops R Studio whoops uses R Studio to access the uh, the core R program. Um, and I guess uh, so that that becomes the environment in which we work. Um, R Studio Cloud is a is an online only uh, virtual cloud computing environment that that is made by the same company, maintained by the same company as um, as our studio, and it um, uh, is it looks identical because it's made by the same company. It is very consistent and very easy to use. And a few weeks ago, in the R group, um, you know, we tested out a a cloud R studio server set up <clears throat> you can use the commercial version or you could use a standalone version like the one i set up you could even set your own up if you wish and and also sometimes the uh the in the day-to-day -day programming we would either use our scripts or we would use markdown language or some some flavor of markdown language like our markdown uh, our studio has also championed and paid for and maintains our markdown uh, I I've begun to question. Uh, I, even though I love our studio as a company, I think they're a fantastic uh, company. I for day to day use by scientists who aren't also computer scientists. I've begun to question some of the choices that our studio has made, like the necessity of the bulk of the tidyverse. You know, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times. I still like the tidyverse. If I'm if I'm honest, I still like ggplot. Think it's really cool but it makes it harder for beginners who are not computer scientists to learn in my observation and likewise their version of markdown doesn't seem necessary to me having our markdown in addition to plain old markdown doesn't seem necessary so we could use markdown or our markdown uh, as part of our day-to-day -day use and a lot of people do and it, it has advantages <clears throat> one really prominent thing that uh, would like to say to you if you've been using R and you haven't used Python a lot, and it, it is probably the biggest difference with making the transition, and it's something we'll encounter as soon as a few minutes from now. And that's that because there is a very focused community for R and a very, very focused company, R Studio, that has a, has a big contribution to uh, to the, the the main R core repository that's maintained by CRAN, the Comprehensive R Archive Network. The quality control for versions of R is very high. The quality control and consistency is very high. And because there's such a high quality control system that is, and it's strictly controlled as well. Um, some people don't even like the amount of control that that is exerted uh, on it because it's an open source project. You literally can download all of the R source code and you can change anything you want. But the strict controls are for the official repositories. And the benefit of that, um, that cost to individual user freedom that, you know, you can just install any old uh, any version of any package or anything they don't allow you to do that for the official installation and the the benefit for that that cost to personal liberty is that pretty much across the whole world unless you have a very very complicated project that you need to maintain and constantly use that that isn't ported forward to the latest version of r it means that everything just always works and the versions uh, be, because the latest versions of packages in R, um, if they're 
if they maintain their status in the, the main repository, and there's only one main repository, the official one, CRAN, if they are allowed to stay in there, they have to make a new version that adheres to every new version of R, every single one, or they're out. Okay, so uh, because of that, R is extremely easy to use as well. All you have to do to, uh, to start working in R and to use almost every um, online resource in the community that you can is you just have to install the most recent version of R, the most recent version of R Studio, and the most recent version of, of any package you care to download out of, you know, take your pick out of more than 10,000. And it just works. It just always works. Very rarely do we come across any problems. Now, let me contrast that to Python. Python, much more powerful language. Most popular language used in teaching and learning these days. But um, what you'll come across very, very soon in your journey into Python is you'll come across the fact that people refer to a fork in the road for, um, for Python versions. One big fork was with, between version two of Python, the major version two and version three, and uh, the syntax changed almost completely. Oh, a lot of the details did anyway, so that if you try to run version two code in a version three installation, it won't work, and vice versa. Version three won't work in ver version two. Some things will work, a lot of things will be broken, but that's only the beginning. Within mo most people these days, especially if you're starting, unless you're working for a company that has a legacy gigantic project or a gigantic piece of software, m most people like us, we would always just install the latest version and forget about it. We would always just install the newest version. Except <laughs> that we also have to consider um, the tool sets that we use. These are analogous to packages and libraries in R. And in, in Python, they're just like in R, really to, to get going on anything interesting, you have to, you're, you, you must use some of these packages. That's where the really fun stuff happens. So to, to do statistics, to make graphs, to do deep learning, to um, make your life easier, there are lots of, of regular packages we download well. The, the quality control there, there are some central repositories uh, for Python libraries, just like there are for R, but there are several of them. There's not one central repository. Not only that, with a particular installation of, of Python, you can actually draw libraries from multiple, um, from multiple repositories. So you can have versioning that is different between different repositories. And this, I think, is a very difficult thing for users who are not computer scientists to start using Python. It, it perhaps is one of the most difficult things because you have, uh, where in R, you don't have to really worry about the versioning of your R um, version and all of the package versions that you use because you always have the newest ones and you don't, everything works and it's backwards compatible almost all the time. In Python, <clears throat> that is certainly not true. Um, anybody who has used Python for any length of time for anything other than a, a tiny local project um, will have experienced version conflicts. And this is something completely foreign to the world of our users. So how do we get around that? Well. Um, if you're an expert user, you, you keep abreast of the requirements for a particular project of every specific version of Python and uh, every specific version of every library that you use. But that takes a lot of skill. And, uh, and frankly, if you're not a computer scientist or if you don't have years of experience, it's not easy to do. And it, it is, I think, the main barrier here to uh, to doing your day to day work in Python if you're not a computer scientist. So a tool that um, has 
has become really, really popular. There are a couple of them. I mean, there is a galaxy of tools. It's actually a much more complicated galaxy than the R galaxy of tools. But in, in Python, um, there's a piece of software that uh, is called Anaconda. Now, there are other solutions to the same problem, but Anaconda is by far the most popular and easy to use. It's free. And what it does when you install it is it acts as an environment for your Python installation. It actually allows you to set up um, your environment and it does it automatically with a version of Python that you pick. By default, it will be, you, you know, you'll pick um, version two or version three. You'll always pick version three, unless you have a very good reason to pick version two. And you'll always pick the recent one, the most recent newest version, unless you have a good reason to pick an older version. What Anaconda does for you is it keeps track of that environment for a particular version. And by default, it installs a lot of the tools that you're, go you're probably going to need. And it alleviates you of the responsibility of keeping track of it. And if you do find that you um, need, need a particular version of Python that you haven't installed, Anaconda also manages instances of uh, other versions of software. Now, I'm not going to suggest we start working in Anaconda today because it, it's more of an advanced tool. But I expect if any of you do anything more than play around, or even if you just want to play around, that you might experience um, Anaconda. So I just wanted to give a little demonstration of what my installation looks like. <clears throat> when you install it, there is a um, there is a uh, there are a few tabs over here on the the left hand side, and your home tab is the one we're on now, and the home tab is this main area. Everything is here uh, in the main area. We have a, a command prompt, which gives us a, um, we can just launch the, all of these tools with a little button here in this particular environment. <clears throat> uh, it gives us a command prompt access to this installation and this environment. We have some other tools. One that I'll mention because I'm going to mention it again is uh, Jupyter Lab and Jupyter Notebook. These are a way we'll experience this today in just a few minutes. These are a way to interface with um, with um, uh, with Python code, and it's it's probably the most popular way to interact with it. If we scroll down a little bit, we have a familiar R Studio and some other things um, that we might check out. All of these are meant to um, to be uh, popular ones, and I, I skipped over these middle ones. I'll just mention PyCharm is a is an interactive development environment. It's analogous to R Studio, but it, uh, you have to make an account with them. I do like PyCharm, but I wouldn't recommend trying it for beginners. The one I really like that's like R Studio is Spider, and it also comes by default with Anaconda. I just want to click on my Environments tab. If I click on the environments, you can see if when you first install this, you'll only have your base installation. But you can see that I have a few others here. I have a, a mini conda environment and it tells me everything that's installed and all the versions. I have one that's specifically for something I call R tutorial, where I, I installed some special R environment um, packages. And I have another one for uh, another special R studio environment that I use with older version of R. So you can keep track of all your environments here. So I'm going to just drag this away and go back to um, tell you a little bit about the rest of the things we use. Now I mentioned this Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab. A Jupyter is a system. It's kind of a very innovative system. It feels foreign in my observation and in my experience to people who have have been used to using R in R scripts, but what it does, it's it's a bit like using um, R in R Markdown. But uh, in R Markdown, we write code, and then we compile the code, and it it makes it into HTML. That's the usual way of of doing it, or maybe a PDF. 
So we interact with pure code and we uh, we present a compiled version of our code for others to consume. What the innovation that Jupyter Notebooks Jupyter Lab does is it um, combines both some compiled and formatted markdown language with blocks of code and we can run the code and get live output. So it's a little bit like the idea of markdown or R markdown, but it's all in a single document type. And the software called Jupyter uh, sort of uh, revolutionized this idea and it really is fun to use these. And not only that, they look good so they can be used as living documents with living code. And it's a little slicker if I if I am honest. It's slicker than R Studio and R to use, and it and I mean it is fun. It's so much fun to use, and it's very it's the easiest way I think to learn Python. It's not the only way. Uh, and if we go even another step beyond that, we have Google Colab, and we're we're gonna take a test drive on Google Colab today. So let, let me back up a half a step because this I've just dropped a lot of information on you if you're new to Python. Anaconda allows you to use uh, in a the simplest way a full installation of Python in your on your local machine, your local laptop. You don't need a powerful laptop um, so that you might use that if you really want to get under the hood and get your hands dirty and, and you want to take you want to learn about taking responsibility for those installations. Through Anaconda, you can use Jupyter Lab or Jupyter. Um, they're, they're two different pieces of so software. I should just say Jupyter Lab. Jupyter is the first kind, and Jupyter Lab is a sort of slicker version of Jupyter that, that I and most people prefer. Jupyter Lab is very easy to use and aesthetically pleasing. <clears throat> Colab has customized all the good features of Jupyter Lab. And it is made a cloud uh, version of Jupyter Lab that's free to use. There are some pros and cons with using cloud software. The, the cons are that you don't have full control over that environment to start with. And also the con is, is that when you want to store data, um, if, you, if you have a local environment, we just store data on our hard drive, or we have Dropbox, or you know some other solution. But on Colab, uh, we have to figure out and put a little thought into what's the best way to manage our data. Being a Google product and released into the wild for the good of the world, um, I mean, some people are critical of Google, Google because they're kind of a big, successful company that makes a lot of money. And it, it may be the fact they don't pay their fair share of taxes. And I, I think they should pay their fair, fair taxes. But having said that, it's one of the best companies in the 21st century, in my opinion, because they have put so much uh, work and effort into open source solutions for scientists, and they've released them all for free to everyone around the world, from developing economies up to the richest economies. We can all benefit from this, and Colab is one of the, the best tools that they've invented and released for free, best for teaching and learning, best for doing real science. Now. There are some limitations to Colab, but those limitations are not even important for us to discuss today. So for the rest of this meeting, what I would like to do, I, I did not have the time um, to set up a, um, a, <clears throat> a um, web page for today, but I will do a GitHub web page with all of this and for future meetings as well when other people present. But most of the, the days that we uh, do here, um, I envision us um, taking turns and agreeing, maybe agreeing ahead of time, what kind of uh, tutorial or experience we're going to go through and, and working through it together. So I've, I've picked one out today. I've adapted this from um, uh, with with not too much modification, a, uh, a an introduction to Google Colab and Python, all rolled up into one. I've got a document that uh, we'll drop into the chat right now.
And uh, the first thing to do with this is to download this um, notebook to your hard drive. And uh, it's this happy collab tutorial IPython notebook. So I'm going to give everyone a chance to uh, download that. And uh, if you want to follow along today, the thing that you will want to do is um, you will want to um, navigate to your uh, Google Drive. So uh, once you download this, go ahead and open your, your Google Drive. And uh, my Google Drive uh, looks like this right now. It's very messy. I've got all sorts of stuff in my folder. And um, <clears throat> this is just the base root folder of my drive. Oh, it's so it's so untidy. But it has a, um, a folder in it called Colab Notebooks. You don't need to make one of these. But I have a one called Colab Notebooks. What you need to do is just drag that notebook into your Google Drive. Just like that, and it will upload it over here. So then it, it turns up down here at the bottom. And if you double click an IPython notebook folder, it will automatically open up in uh, Google Colab. Now, can I just get an indication in chat of who plans to follow along with this today? Just a Y in chat if you are, and an N in chat if you don't. <laughs> Joe's following, Florence is following. Peter, yes. Um, Joseph, could um could I ask you if you're gonna follow along with it and have uh collab open? Uh could I ask you to share your screen and walk us walk us through the first couple of tabs, but only only the first couple together, and then I really want everybody to just work on this. And if there's a problem, some of us who have used collab before can help. I have to excuse myself for a moment for about five minutes, and I'll be right back. Is that okay, Joseph? Yeah, yeah that's fine. fine. Okay, I'll be right back. All right, let me share my screen. Can everybody see what I'm seeing? Um, I don't have feedback since I've shared my screen. I can't see the chat somehow, so I'll just. Uh, we we can see it, uh, Joe. No problem. The only thing is, it may not. It may only be me, but it's quite small. The text. If you could zoom in, that would be quite useful. I think. Ah, uh, perfect. Thank you. It was only you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> only me. <laughs> My eyesight, probably. It's all those years of looking at insects down the microscope. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, so, yeah, um, I don't know where to start, really. So we can just read through the first, um, the first tab. All right, so it's just an uh, introduction uh, going over the uh, what is expected of us um, and what we expect to learn from this tutorial. So basically this will cover basic Python and its data types, containers, lists, dictionaries, sets, tuples, functions and classes. 
and then um, it will go into NumPy, where uh, this is a package for library for multi-dimensional arrays. So things like array indexing, data types, array math, broadcasting will be discussed therein. And then there will be matplotlib, which is basically for plotting, um, which is important, especially if you're doing um, scientific work. Um, that becomes important. Matplotlib borrows heavily from uh, MATLAB. That's why somewhere above it says some of you may have previous knowledge in MATLAB, in which case we also recommend um, the NumPy for MATLAB users page. So scientific computing in Python, I think borrows a little bit heavily from MATLAB, especially NumPy and Matplotlib. And to some extent, SciPy, which is linked there, uh, because most of the scientific computing people who use Python heavily are migra migrating from uh, MATLAB. And then also this will cover IPython, uh, which is basically about creating notebooks such as the IPython notebook that uh, Ed has just shared. So basically you will see that your, the file that Ed shared uh, is called hap e collab tutorial.ipynb. The ipynb is ipython notebook, uh, literally. So I'm guessing that's um, what we're going to do. So first off, a brief note on Python versions. Um, so as of the 1st January 2020, Python dropped all support for Python 2, the second version, which was a really popular version of Python and one that most people will have started doing Python in. So quite a few of the tutorials that you find online about Python will still be in Python 2, but um, this has been phased out for now Python 3. And uh, in this tutorial, according to what it says, it used Python um, 3.7. So like Ed said, um, the call the collab notebooks. I thought someone spoke. Yeah. It may have been me because I came back. Ah, uh, all right. I'll, I'll hand over back to you, Ed. Uh, thank you for doing that. My <clears throat> my daughter's staying home from school today unexpectedly because her her school group closed and her laptop uh, speaker wasn't working. I have someone's hand up. LCD. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, I'm using uh, Mac. Uh, it doesn't look right that uh, when I try to open the, the file, it's going to open. Any application that need to be? Set? Yeah. <clears throat> um, did you upload it to your uh, Google Drive? No. You have to upload it to Google Drive. Oh, OK, all right. And open it from Google Drive. From Google Drive, yeah, all right. OK, thanks. Yes. No problem. No problem. I'm just going to share my screen over here. Uh, can I ask before before we go on? Um, I wanted to ask if everybody had a chance to to do that step, upload to Google Drive, and get it successfully open in um, in your browser. Are we? Uh, we'll give Elsie a minute to do that. Yeah, I also have Mac, so I think same problem. E even Mac users can do this. This is not this is not going to exclude anybody. That's a little bit of joke towards Mac users. Sorry about that. Um, but you do have to upload it to Google Drive first. This won't work without that. <clears throat> Doing it this way.
if you want to follow along, I'll just give it one more 30 seconds. Um, this is quite a long um, tutorial here. We're not going to finish it today, but the idea here is to, for people who wanted to go along with this, to um, upload this, get into the habit of uploading something to Google Drive and opening it directly into CoLab. It works very nicely, um, but it is essential to get your head around that different way of working. You can open them directly as well uh, so that you can explore the tools. We're not going to exhaustively do that because CoLab is actually quite a complex piece of software. Go on, Peter. Uh, sorry, Eddie. Maybe if you don't mind, maybe if you, you could show us how to do for how to do it, like how to upload it. Okay, I thought I did show that, but uh, let me. Um, what am I? Uh, what am I sharing here? There we go. <clears throat> thought I did show that before I went away, but I'll show it again. No problem. If uh, if you've downloaded that that script that I I had put into um, the chat. I'll just put it in the chat again. If you download this locally to your computer, and then you open your, your Google Drive, you can put it anywhere in your Google Drive. You just, you just drag it over and drop it anywhere. Then once you do that, when you have the tutorial down here at the very bottom of my screen is that tutorial, all you have to do is double click it and it automatically opens in Google Colab, the same file. Is that okay? Yep. Okay. All right, so this, um, the nice thing about, that I like about uh, IPython notebooks or, or Jupyter Lab notebooks, is that it embeds um, code and text. And one thing I wanted to show you is that if you if you click on just this introduction section uh, and mouse over the the margin of it, I'm I'm mousing over the the um, interface between this section that I clicked on and the section below it. We get a little bit of a visual cue if you see when I click back and forth. And when we do that, there are some context specific menus that I think are interesting to know about. Over here, if we select one of these, we get some uh, context specific menus and um, you can click on some of them. Can I get you to mute your microphone if it's not, um, if you're not speaking now, please? <coughs> you can uh, add comments, you can, um, you can link, uh, to different cells. You can move a block up and down. So now this block has been moved below this one. We can move it back up. For text, there are two kinds of blocks. And if we move between the interface of these two, we can see that there's a, we can add a, a plus a code block or plus a text block. So we don't have to add any blocks for this tutorial, but that's the basic functionality of it. The text blocks just have information. They might be, um, what I would like to do if I were sharing this to other people is give a little bit of information about what we're going to do. You can embed links to other information on the web. If this was more of a scientific um, IPython notebook, we might say that, um, you know, I'm going to use this here a method, XXX, and uh, that links to this academic publication why 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 so you can you can build knowledge that way exploiting the you know what is in these text blocks but most people use these for um, the way we're going to use them anyway are for um, information about the script itself and so uh, what Joe was saying is um, that uh, there are different versions of Python like I mentioned but the thing I really want to do in this Python version block is um, talk about inputs and outputs. So the, the text blocks are just static information. You can edit them. You can edit them by um, hitting the pencil for edit, or you can double click them. 
in Colab, a really nice thing is here on the right when you're editing, or on the left, I mean, is the raw text. And uh, it's in Markdown. And when you have um, a Markdown header with one or more <clears throat> asterisks, I mean, uh, hash marks, it shows up in a in a uh, hierarchical table of contents. And it shows you the what you see is what you get, the WYSIWYG compiled version on the right. So if we just if we just um, click out of that, oops, <clears throat> it just shows us the compiled version. But what I want to show you now is a is a, a code block. Now code blocks are meant to be run, and by default, the um, the uh, output is displayed right under the code block. And I haven't run this yet today. This is an older version of this tutorial, and the output has been saved. And you can actually um, clear the output. I've just clicked into the text box, got the tooltip, and if you click on the three little dots over here, you can clear the output for that block. And the way you run a block, you have a couple of options. You, you click in the block, and you can either click run on the little arrow here, or you see the tooltip has come up that you can run shift uh, run the cell by clicking control plus enter. Well, that's of course how we're all going to run it with a hotkey. And if we run it, we can see that um, it's executing. Now I haven't, I haven't even started. Should have made you look up here real quick. I'm just going to disconnect um, this for a second. Oh, I'm not going to disconnect it. But uh, before I ran this. This wasn't connected, and now a virtual light uh, environment has been booted up in the cloud for us um, to do this. And we can see that the the version that's in Google Cloud, Google Colab Cloud, now is uh, 3.7.10. So this command is a Python command issued to the installation of Python in Colab, the default version, and it just asks us to tell us. Uh, asks the system to tell us what version we're running. Now, most of this uh, tutorial is set up by having a little bit of information and then having a code block that you can execute. Um, I think the code is not super simple, and it is the syntax is different from um, from R. The idea today, I think, for the last few minutes we have is to run a few of these, get a feel for how Python code looks, but more importantly, getting a feel for how Colab works. Any questions at this point? I'm so I'm go on. I'm trying to open the file with Drive. I'm still trying to open the file with Google Drive, so we did, but it doesn't open. OK. Why don't you um, why don't you share your screen with us? OK. So here it is. So I have the 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 file here. And I opened it. And this is how, what I get. I'm still, um, there's a little bit of screen lag, so I'm still waiting to see what you're seeing. There we okay. go. There we go. So you're, you're uh, in Google Drive. <clears throat> mm -hmm. You're in my drive. Can you, um, can you scroll down a little bit? So you're seeing, I don't know what you're seeing. <laughs> your screen might be frozen. You're in my, you, so you're, I'm in the Google Drive, right? Yeah, I see your Google Drive. Page. Uh, okay. Will you scroll down? I think it's quite slow at the moment. Maybe will that's you, my. Will you scroll down a little bit? <clears throat> it's 
sounds like she might be frozen. I think um, there's, yeah. there's, there's an issue. I think, with... I think I'm having Wi Fi. There's, there's a known bug, Ed, with screen sharing. Yeah, I'll try it. I'll try it after the. Ah, oh, OK. What's the bug? So with... I might try it after. What is the bug with screen sharing, Joe? Uh, it overloads the CPU and basically freezes. Is that a Mac issue? Yeah, yeah, it's a Mac issue. Yeah. Oh, OK. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've, it's, I use a Mac at home. Uh, I've experienced it when working from home. OK. Well, Juliana, um, can you see my screen? So I'll try. Yeah, I'll try the tutorial. <laughs> can you see my screen uh, now, Juliana? Yeah. I was, yes, I can. OK, good. What I was trying to get you to do was to um, to scroll down in your file list and to uh, look for the the file in the file list, not not in mm -hmm. the suggested panes up here, but down in the file list and try to. Um, to uh, double... OK, go on. you you speak, go on from there. Oh, just I'm saying, I'm just saying if I open it from there directly from the from the list, then. Yep. Okay. Try that. No, it says. Uh, no, it doesn't open. It says it says I need to download it, but somebody doesn't open. Can you try to right click it? Um, Julia, how do you right click on a Mac, Joe? To get this uh, context menu. Uh, should be just two <laughs> fingers on the uh, touchpad. Can you two fingers on the touchpad and, and just mouse over this open with Juliana and see if it says Google Collaboratory right at the top? Uh, I need to. Uh, G was saying I need to. Okay, that makes sense. <clears throat> I don't know what we're doing right now. I don't think you need to. Um, do you need to install Colab on, on the Mac, Joe? I, I, I haven't done previously. I mean, I did the whole week challenge without really? installing it. I, I don't think you have to install anything. I think that Colab is cloud only. Um, do you get this context menu, Juliana? Can you confirm that you can see the open with and you have some options there? What are your options? Uh, let me just tell you what my options are. Okay. Uh, so it has open with and it says connect more apps. Can I suggest? Uh, um, so Juliana, I guess I do need to download Colab. Yeah, maybe try it. Can I suggest you and yep. Xi Jing uh, get together because she says she's just solved this on a Mac? Yep. Okay, good, good. I'll do that then. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, I mean, for the rest of us, we're nearing our time together to end, but uh, we can go through a couple of these. It's so easy to do. We just click in a in a um, in in a uh, code block, control enter, and it automatically runs, and we should see the head out. Now, what I like to do when I start one of these, especially if it's a tutorial or a script I'm running for the first time, is I like to uh, clear the um, the uh, all the output <clears throat> and we can find uh, that in the edit menu to clear all the outputs so I like to have a blank slate when I'm doing that 
<clears throat> so I'm going to do the first few together, just narrating it, but then I'm going to let people go um, <clears throat> and uh, do this on their own. And we, we can report back and we can chat in the Slack uh, if we have any any issues while we're doing it and just help each other that way. So this first one just shows a little bit of an algorithm. This is a, a basic computer science algorithm for sorting. It's called a quick sort. It takes a string of integers or other kinds of numbers and, um, and it's, it sorts them in numerical order. So we can just see how that is. One of the things of this is we've defined a function here. So this is the syntax to define a function. It implements the, um, the uh, uh, sorting algorithm. And, and typically, if we want to print outputs um, to output explicitly, we would wrap the, the command that we want to print the output of in the print function. We do this, the syntax is very similar to R. So when we do that, we sort this in increasing order for this string using our um, quick sort function that we just defined up there. There are all sorts of um, of numerical <clears throat> uh, operations and syntax that's specific to Python, and there are some fairly big differences. They don't look very different, but conceptually the differences are extremely different to, to R. We can ignore almost all that now, and we're just going to do the basic syntax. The basic numerical syntax is, is almost identical uh, in the way that it looks. So we can assign things. The assignment operator in Python is the equal sign, unlike R. And the type function tells us what type of um, variable um, that we're storing. This, what we see is we, we print the uh, numeral three back, the contents of X, and we also print the type. In this case, it's um, the type is a class of variable container and in this case, plain old integer. One of the nice things, if you've ever done any programming in other um, languages than R, is R, the, the passive aggressive butler in R will guess what we want if we're not being very specific. And we didn't tell here in Python, we didn't tell the Python's version of the passive aggressive butler what type of container we wanted X to be. It just guessed, we put an integer in it, and it guessed that that's the type of container we did. So we have that also in Python, and sometimes it doesn't do what we want. So we need to be careful. We can also print basic basic arithmetic based on our value of three. This, if we have the explicit print values here, this will print um, all of these values. So we get those values. But if I added a code block and I copied and pasted this, into our new code block, and I took away the the um, print statements. In R, um, we would get all of the um, outputs one by one out in the console if we submitted this block. But in Python, we only get the most recent one, and that's that illustrates why we use that print function if you if we want the printed output. In this code block, I'm just going to do a couple more, and we're almost out of time, and I'll leave people to work through this on their own. Um, but I'll leave a few minutes if people want to talk who, who um, haven't been successful at launching it. I think Juliana's taken care of, but I'll leave a few minutes to problem solve in case some people didn't get started. But I will talk through these last couple of blocks. This little bit of syntax I wanted to explain because they're um, there isn't similar syntax to this in R that is part of the base syntax, but it's a common bit of syntax and it represents symbolically a common um, thing that we want to do. It's mostly a computer science thing or a scientific computing thing as opposed to a statistics coding thing. And it's to increment a value by one. And uh, we use the plus equals. Maybe I'll just make this a little bit bigger. I should have done this earlier. We use the uh, plus equals um, syntax to increment the value in X uh, by one and printing it. So what this should do is it should say, I want to take 
the value in X and I want to um, add one to it and I want to put that new value that I added one to back into X. So the uh, increment syntax here takes the value of X. We know the value of X is three. We just assigned it. It's going to add one to it and then it's going to print X will equal four and then it's going to um, print a uh, take X and multiply equal the value by by two. So the value of X will be four by the time the code gets to this block. It'll multiply that by two and put the results back in X. It will be eight. So it should print four and then print eight. Let's see if that's what it does do. Thank goodness that's what it did do. Now we've made a new variable. We're just going to set it to 2.5. We're going to print the type. Um, now this won't be a um, an integer. It'll be uh, a uh, probably a float. Uh, let's see what it what it tells us it is. And then it's going to print several operations that we tell it incrementally. So let's see what that does. Three, two, one. So class float and it does the operations. All right. So um, you can keep on with it. Uh, this is quite a long bit of a tutorial, but it's a good start. Uh, remember, the point here is not to learn all the details and definitions of syntax in Python. We'll do that in the coming weeks, but instead to um, to basically experience how Colab works. Are there any outstanding questions about Colab uh, before we uh, before we close or any comments? I, I also challenged people to if they had some specific resources that they really like that they think would be appropriate in this group uh, to bring some. Are there any comments along either of those lines? Go on, Joe. It's Wild West now. Everybody can unmute. Oh, OK, perfect. Um, I've got a resource, um, but uh, for some reason I can't. I don't seem to be able to share it in this. It's not letting me paste it into the uh, chat here, okay. so I'll drop it into the Slack later. OK, what is your resource, Joe? Uh, it's a um, it's a, uh, a university in the US. I can't remember which one, but it's a, a basically a lecturer there and he's got a from sort of the very starting point to quite advanced Python tutorial. Uh, but he's been teaching for, I think he says 20 years or something like that. And uh, that's what I used to teach myself last summer. And is that found... the free code camp? No, no, it's not. I, I, I wish I could share it. I'll, I'll drop it into Slack as soon as I can. Drop it into Slack. That'll be cool. I mean, we kind of like maybe we want to do some together for the first few meetings. So maybe in a, in a week or two, you could you could show us that and we could do one together the first one or second one whatever one you think is appropriate yeah sounds good um a, a thing that i wanted elsa dig do you have a your hand up or is that still from before not sure it's, it's been there for a while i think it's, it's been probably. there for a while okay i just wondered if uh if it was new i think a thing that i wanted to say is that um I struggle with this uh, sometimes in my teaching is that I observe that different kinds of people, um, it's easy for them to learn in different ways. Not everybody's the same. And with technical stuff, programming and math stuff, um, and especially with learning programming languages and doing statistics and data science kinds of stuff, I've identified a couple of different ways that people like to learn. I mean, some people like to watch somebody else do stuff and get ideas and then later on their own implement to solve their own problem with it. That's one way. A way that's really popular right now is going through a, um, going through a, a tutorial and working at, the, at, at real time. The downside of a tutorial is it, it kind of takes a long time. You have to set aside side time for going through the tutorial and um, probably by doing a tutorial, it's not going to directly solve any problem that you're likely to have. And so it, it takes that time, but it, it might not solve a problem if you need a, an answer now. And like another way of doing it would be to um, <clears throat> read a book. 
some people like books. I like to read books. That's my favorite way to teach myself new things. Very thorough. I can skip back and forth between sections and there's good organization of it. Uh, but there's enough detail to satisfy me if I'm really interested in a particular topic that is almost always lacking from uh, tutorials. It frustrates me with some tutorials. And another way that somebody recently, uh, I don't know if Matt Butler is in this meeting today. I don't think he is. I don't see him, but um, he mentioned that if you already have some skills, like if you're already doing a lot of programming, that a, um, a cheat sheet is a very efficient way. So maybe if I wanted to take all my skills and I wanted to do random forest in Python, but I didn't, I can, I can do it from heart for just from memory in R, but I couldn't do that in Python that, you know, probably the best thing for me would be a cheat sheet for, um, for the, the appropriate libraries and functions to perform a random force in Python. And I could do it fastest then. All of those are legitimate ways. And I, I think over the coming weeks, I'd like to try some of each of those. And I think the last idea that I had is that, um, that there is one other popular way to teach yourself programming these days. Um, it's it may be suitable for uh, for us to try out at one point, but it's a kind of learning that um, where somebody sets up a a an online resource and there's an interactive tutorial where the environment that you're using, unlike Colab, Colab is something that we have to provide the document for or find a document somewhere on the web to be able to use it. It's very powerful. But this is the kind of thing that just says, uh, OK, now we're going to learn about um, uh, variable types in Python. So type X plus three into the window and you type X plus three and uh, it gives you an answer in an interactive fashion. And th there's a there's a tutorial based site that has all sorts of all all programming languages in it, except R. It doesn't have R on it, but it's got loads of resources for um, Python and that's called Free Code Camp. <clears throat> Free Code Camp, and you don't have to install anything to go along with Free Code Camp. Um, and I, I, I highly recommend it. I think it's, I think it's great. There are even some high quality um, lectures on there, and everything from really basic to advanced um, is on there. So uh, that's all I've got. If there aren't any more questions, uh, Joe Mahengo. Uh, I've I've taken the, liber taken the liberty to put you down for next week. <laughs> what, what would you like to do? Um, what would you like to do for next week? <laughs> do you have any ideas? Just find just find us something that we go through real time. Yeah, um, I think I don't know if people will have become comfortable working in collab by next week uh, but maybe what i would do is to uh, bring something that everybody might want to might, might be familiar with uh, so we can talk about how to start using python practically so maybe just the basics of you have a data set the way we have a data set a csv in r how do you get that CSV into Python? And um, how do you set yourself up to start manipulating that CSV? Maybe recalculating some columns, combining columns, the kinds of things you would do with, say, Diplier. Um, or we can look at maybe what most people are interested in if you have images how do you load images into python and how do you view them and start doing some calculations so uh, we might talk about just the basics of loading data because once you know where your data is and you've loaded it and you know where it's stored um, in your environment then it sets you up to start looking at the more advanced analysis that you can do so maybe that's what i would do next week if that's something people would be interested in. Yeah, I think that's a great idea there. Recently now, I looked at this uh, with you at that Kaggle Pandas tutorial, and it does mm. a similar thing, except I noticed that the data set it used was a 50 megabyte Kaggle data set. Mm. 
and I went through it uh, like we talked about on um, Gradient, that alternative to Colab. But it was irritating to me that it was such a large data set for such a simple concept. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're right. Something like that. How do I get my data into Python? I think that would be an excellent choice. Yeah, we could start with maybe just the Iris data set and maybe just some five images, maybe from the wheat challenge or some potato images, just five, a data set of five images. How do you yeah. get get them into Python and how do you find yourself knowing exactly where your images are so that you can call them anytime, display them, rotate them, manipulate them and things like that. Kind of sensitive. I don't want to give anybody homework unless they want to do homework outside. So mm. if you want to prepare something, that's fine. But like uh, just changing a few lines in that first pandas tutorial on Kaggle would be perfect for this, replacing the giant data set with a, with a um, iris data set or anything. Yeah, I think that's that's what I'm going to do, actually. Yeah. Uh, uh, for images, I can quickly just fire up some images from my computer and just show people. Uh, my, my interest is, or at least it's a personal interest for me too, because it will also be a learning experience for me. You always learn something new when you do this. Uh, it's just to set myself up to be comfortable that, you know, when you're working in Colab, unlike R, you don't have a window somewhere telling you everything that's in your environment. Um, so just to build that intuition while you're working in Colab, I think it's important. So I thought maybe everyone might also be interested in doing that. OK, so we have a plan. Before next time, here are what people do. Uh, I will set up a website of some form in some form in some place, probably a GitHub website following my own uh, advice there to set up a, a space to automatically put up materials for future meetings. Joe's going to find us a tutorial to read in some data, and everybody else will think about possible future topics. Maybe they would volunteer to run a week and get a schedule going. But more importantly, um, to uh, to go through this collab tutorial that we did today. If you have any problems getting off the ground and you didn't follow along today, then um, maybe we can uh, maybe we can um, take that to Slack. Anything else? Just to say quickly, Ed, I posted that course I was talking about in the comments here. Uh, it, yeah, it was just very slow to copy it in for some reason. I see that. That looks good. We'll have to check it out. Would that be the kind of thing that uh, shall I put you down for a couple of weeks to uh, bring this one of those to the to the group? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I just need to double check to make sure there's not too much overlap between the uh, collab notebook that you've already shared. I, I think there are a lot of beginners in here. Um, so a little redundancy is probably a good thing to reinforce some of those ideas. But uh, if you look at it, have a thing, drop it in Slack. We'll get you on the schedule. Yeah, drop, put me on the schedule regardless. Uh, I'll come up with something. Cool. All right, guys. We'll see you later. Hope that got some people started. And we'll solve some problems in Slack if there are any. We'll, we'll see you later. Thanks, Ed. Pleasure. <laughs>